Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, today I want to talk about the illusion, the illusion, the hoax of the Salafi Sufi divide and everything in between, right? Because, you know, I've talked before the difference between the word Aqidah, which is a certain group's view of what is the reality of the unseen and what they what they hold to be true versus the word iman which is the quranic term and what what islam requires us to do is believe in the term of iman and the articles of iman right and in the same way i have talked about how aqidat al-tahawiyya and aqidat al-wasatiyya how the books of the ashariya and the people who uh, follow Sheikh Imam Ibn Taymiyyah the differences are so slight that it is not even uh, it, it, it has it does not diffuse anyone's Iman in any whatsoever when you actually look at the text in the same way I talked about what are the true scholars what are the true fuqaha what is their attitude and what is their work and what is their job compared to what we are doing uh, because we get caught in this trap in this uh, Salafi Sufi trap, you can say. And so today I want to demonstrate uh, this thing. And so please, if you have never heard what I'm about to say before, please uh, think about it with an open mind because you need an open mind to open your mind. And so I want to, um, and, and over here I want to say that, you know, this, this whole Salafi Sufi divide is part of the agenda as I showed in the Rand report in one of my talks uh that this is one of the uh one of the agendas that they have to uh to shut down the real debate uh that muslims need to be having the real discussion muslims need to be having now when we talk about the salafi and the sufi divide we are talking about basically you can say two gigantic personalities uh, who we think don't would would not get along you know and these two gigantic personalities are Imam Ghazali and Imam Ibn Taymiyyah. They would have obviously nothing in common, right? Or they would have very little in common or they would severely disagree with each other's our normal state of thinking about these two personalities. May Allah have mercy upon them. Imam Ghazali comes from a tradition where, and this is important because the background is important, you know, Muslims had an empire. Muslims were... Uh, close to a decline but not yet to a dec decline and one of the ways to renew the uh, help the ummah is by a process called islah islah is a type of reform reforming people to their original state uh, but it's done internally you try to fix things internally and Imam Ibn Taymiyyah because he was there when the Mongols were there Islam was completely decimated and Instead of just using the process of Islah, he also used the process of Tajdeed, which is a complete renewal, right? And so uh, you can say the Salafi Sufi divide uh, is, is, it really needs to be understood in a, in a different way, which I'm going to explain today, okay? So let's get started, inshallah, very quickly. Were Imam Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah so different after all? I remember. Unfortunately, I never got the book, but I remember when I was in Egypt, there was one author, I don't know his name anymore, because this is like more than, I don't know, more than 20 years ago. But when I was in Egypt, I remember a Muslim brother had written a book on the common opinions, the common ideas between Imam Ibn Taymiyyah and Imam Ghazali. And these were both geniuses and genius people, and they both had a lot of common ideas. And so, uh, you know, I will talk about Uthman Danfolio in a second. Uh, I think I need to move that slide over to a different place. So, uh, the day two scholar slapped me. Again, he's talking about great people like Imam Nathamia and Imam Ghazali. Imam Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah on fanaticism. I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, one that is not here. I'm just going to verbally mention it. 
and one uh, the example of fanaticism, right? And you know, because there's a lot of takfir going on, and we don't consider the other side to be really true Muslims. So Imam Ghazali writes, if you see a scholar declaring others infidels and misguided, and we have, I see so many youth, you know, on the internet, they're just, everyone's just misguided. It's just this anger, right? It's not authentic. It's not the place of peace and quiet and tranquility and wisdom. If you see a scholar declaring, if you see a scholar declaring others infidels and misguided, shun him. Do not busy your heart or your tongue with him. The problem is we have, we've been affected by these so, people so much that we act like these people. Provocations and knowledge are undoubtedly from people's nature, and the ignorant one is unable to exercise patience with them. And due to this, differences have multiplied amongst people. He's talking about his time. Now imagine our time. If knowledge was forcefully taken from the ignorant, then differences would subside. Okay. Imam Nithaymiya says, Rahmatullah alayhi, on Imam Ghazali and in Imam Nithaymiya, I heard our Shaykh Ibn Taymiya, one of his students writes, uh, al Dahabi writes, say towards the end of his life, I will never declare anyone from the people of the Qibla. And there's a hadith that he's referring to actually here. I will never declare anyone from the people of the Qibla as an infidel. Okay. And we may not say others are infidels or in, other people are kafir, but we come pretty close a lot of times. Oh, that person has nothing to do with Islam. Or that person, you know, what is that person? That person's not authentic. Or that person's not on the manhaj. Or that per we're all eating the same halal food. We're all eating. We're praying towards the same qibla. We all say the same shahada. We all read the same Quran. But yet, that person is not your brother. You won't say salams to him because of the effect of this illusionary Salafi Sufi divide. And, and there is ta'asub, both the people of tasawwuf and Sufism have has ta'asub towards the Salafi brothers, but the Salafi brothers really have ta'asub. You know, they think they are, you know, they got it so much more made than the Sufi brothers. And it's just not true. And I'm going to show you every major scholar, every major scholar, including Abdul Wahab, whatever opinion you have of Abdul Wahab, he was used by the British or he was used by the Saud, whether he had good intentions or bad intentions. Regardless, Imam Nitaimiya, Imam Ghazali, Shawliullah, you take any great scholar, you will find that they were a mixture of the Salafi Sufi. And you will also find that their teachers go back to the same people. Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab's teacher was a Sufi, a Sindhi. You can look this up. A Sindhi's teacher was, as, uh, his teacher was a Zabidi. A Zabidi's teacher was Shawliullah Muhaddas Dilbi Rahmatullah But you also find what? Shawliullah teaching a Zabidi, a Zabidi teaching a Sindhi. A Sindhi taught uh, Umar Jibreel, who taught Uthman Danfolio and brought the great Khilafa movement in, 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 in Africa. And he was a person of the Sabuf, Sufi. But what happens is, what happens is, there is a great scholar, and he has 10 things to talk about. So let's say he, he can talk about Islamic eschatology, and he can talk about tafsir, and he can talk about... And different people pick on different aspects of that scholar. And so then they get, you know, this Sufi-Salafi divide did not exist till the 19th century. This, this Sufi-Salafi divide... Imam Nitaimiya belonged to a Sufi group. Now, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab praised a lot of the Sufis. So did Imam Nitaimiya. So did, and, and then when you think about Imam Ghazali, you're thinking, oh, he's a person, or you must be like a Sufi. No, that's not the point. The point is what you think a Sufi is, is not what a Sufi is. Or I don't even like the word Sufi, actually. I like the word Tasawwuf, a person who deals with the science of the heart. For example, what would you think that Imam Ghazali said about jihad? What would you think he said? Right? What do you think Imam Ghazali said about jihad? Do you think that he thought it was mandatory or he thought it was just uh, optional? It's good if you do it, but I'll show you what he thought. And he has a stronger opinion than you can even ever, ever, ever imagine. So, here we are. Now, Imam Ghazali plus Imam Ibn Taymiyyah equal 
Shawli wa la muhaddas dil bi rahmatun ali. I'm going to tell you why I'm pointing this out. Because Shawliullah is that person who translated the Qur'an for the first time in a different language. And that's where it became popular. In the beginning, all the fatwas were against him. But let me just read this to you so you begin to understand not only what how great of a scholar Shawliullah is, but I'm trying to deal with this hoax of the Sufi-Salafi divide. A great civilization must have resilience to renew itself from within. And the thing is that a part of the division, it's not the part of the difference is, is how you see this renewal of the ummah. Is it through islah of the individual or is it by, uh, is it by uh, a tajdid, a renewal, a renew, renewing. So remember these words, islah or tajdid. A great civilization must have resilience. Must have resilience to renew itself from within. It is what distinguishes a civilization from mere dynasty. Islamic civilization has demonstrated time and again its innate capacity for renewal after every disaster. The death of the Prophet ﷺ was the first great trial. Now, I don't agree with his chronological order because I think there are more, but it's generally true. The second major challenge was that of the ideas of the Greece and India, and the Islamic world internalized these ideas, developed them, uh, and after a period of... Uh, tribulation by the Mu'tazilite ideas, they were a challenge for the Muslims. And this is where Abu Musa Ashtari came in and others like Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. The challenge of the Greek, okay, that was there. The challenge of the Greek ideas ended with the eloquence, the eloquent defense of Imam Ghazali. When Imam Ghazali wrote the book, The al Falasifa, the Greek philosophy just vanished into thin air. Islam overcame that challenge through its inner resilience embodied in tasawwuf. This is a fact. No one can deny this. The fourth challenge came, but what he's, he's missing here is the challenge that Imam Nathemiyah dealt with, which was the, the Mongols. Okay? And then the fifth challenge was from Europe, which we are currently dealing with. And, and the number one thing that the greatest scholar of, of the 12th century, Shawli Ullah Muhaddas Dilmi, who's the teacher of both the Salafis and the Sufis. Let me repeat this. Shawliullah is the teacher of the Salafis and the Sufis. How? Uh, he is the teacher of the Salafis because he is the grand grand teacher of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. And Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab's teacher, As Sindhi, was a Sufi, his main teacher. And before as Sindhi, everyone had rejected him as a student, but that's a whole different issue I'm not going to go into right now. But as Sindhi was a Sufi. But Shawliullah was not just a Sufi. He was also willing to, he was not also 100% for taqlid either, just follow one mashab. He was open to doing ijtihad. But he believed that if you are, if you don't know the deen, if you don't know the dalail, then you should follow a mashab. This was his opinion. Okay? Now, Shawlullah Muhaddas Delvi was the teacher of the Salafis because you also have every, every person when he's a new Muslim, the Salafi brothers give you the book Taqwiyatul Iman, Shah Ismail Shahid, the grandson of Shawlullah's book, uh, Shawli, uh, grandson of Shawlullah Muhaddas Delvi, he, you know, because he's considered one of the teachers of the, of the quote unquote Wahhabi movement, which is a term I really don't like. But my point is not to be towards Sufi or towards the Salafi because what I'm saying is this is a hoax. And what I'm saying is that both were actually merged together in the great ones like Imam Ghazali, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, and Shaulullah Muhaddis Dili, which I'm going to show you. So what is the difference? The difference is that the difference is that one essentially looked at how to solve the problems through Islam, inner reform. And the other looked at how to solve the problem by bringing the Sharia, by changing the outer things. If you change the outside, that's what needs to be done. We need to renew and rebuild the outside. And the other side, Islam was to rebuild the inside. So what did Shaulillah do?
Mughal rulers to give up their corrupt and in, 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 insufficient, inefficient practices. Soldiers to inculcate within them the spirit of jihad. Artisans, workers, and peasants to remind them that the economic prosperity of the state depended on laborers. The emperor asking him to teach a lesson to the Juts threatening the Mughal Empire. These were Hindus. He also wrote and advised them not to give j j land to the uh, people who were not loyal. Okay, Masses to be conscious of their duties and not to indulge in the accumulation of wealth. So this is some things that Shavalina did, but the greatest thing that he did was to translate the Qur'an. Now, one of the grand students of Shaulila Muhaddas Delvi, how Islam went into Africa, and particularly the, Af the Sufi, or the I like the word the Sabuf, Islam went there. Uthman Danfolio learned the Qur'an in Arabic language while traveling to further pursue, pursue his studies. He studied under Sheikh Jibra'il bin Umar in the land of uh, Tawarik. Sheikh Jibrail directed his attention to serious study of the Quran and Sunnah. Previous to that, Sheikh Jibrail made pilgrimage and was greatly influenced by the followers of Ibn Abdul Wahhab in Mecca. But he was actually studying under a Sindhi who was the teacher of Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, and he was also and he was, interestingly enough, a Sindhi was he was a Sufi who didn't follow any Mashab. Okay. Uh, a little bit different than Shaulullah, Muhaddas Dervi's opinion, but he was a Sufi who believed in not following any mashab, just follow Quran and Sunnah. So, let me also read this to you. Uh, Shaulullah, Muhaddas Dervi, who's the, who is the, uh, he is from the Chishti Sensala, okay, that's just what he is. He wrote books in six categories. The first deals with the Holy Quran. It includes his translation of the holy book into Persian. He was the first one to translate Quran. And all the translations we have in the world are because of the works of Shaulullah Muhaddas Delvi, just so you know. So imagine his greatness, right? The literary language of the subcontinent of those times. According to him, the object of studying the book is to reform human nature, to correct the wrong beliefs. Remember this. The purpose of the book is to reform the human nature and correct the wrong beliefs and injurious actions the second category deals with hadith in which he has left behind several works, including an Arabic and Persian commentaries on Muatta, a well-known collection of the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ compiled by Imam Malik. He attached great importance to this collection of traditions by Imam Malik, even greater than those of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. Okay? And so... Uh, he attached great importance to these collections of traditions by Imam Malik, even greater than Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. He was an outstanding standing muhaddis. This is why he's called uh, Shaulullah Muhaddis, De Muhaddis Delvi is what he's called. He's called a muhaddis. An outstanding muhaddis and the links of all modern scholars of hadith in the Indian subcontinent may be traced to him, not only Indian subcontinent, but Africa and also many parts of the Arab world. He had the greatest amount of influence. Foremost among these modern the uh, traditionalists was his son and successor Shah Abdul Aziz, okay, and Sayyid Murtaza. Shaulullah wrote a number of books and pamphlets dealing with hadith. The third category deals with fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence, which includes Insaf fil Bayan Isbab Isbab Ikhtilaf, which is a brief but very interesting and informative history of. of Islamic jurisprudence of the last five centuries. The fourth category deals with his works dealing with mysticism, meaning tasawwuf. Okay. The fifth category pertains to on his works of Muslim philosophy and ilmul kalam. He wrote a pamphlet on the principles of ijtihad and taqlid. In his principle of ijtihad, he clarifies whether it is obligatory for a Muslim, obligatory for a Muslim to adhere to one of the four schools of Islamic jurisprudence or whether he is, it is obligatory for a Muslim to adhere to one of the four schools of Islamic jurisprudence or whether he can exercise his own judgment. In the opinion of Shaulullah, a layman should rigidly follow his own imam, but a man well versed in Islamic law can exercise his own judgment and should be in conformity with a, uh, with conformity of the practice of the Prophet. The most outstanding of all his works, Hujatullah Baligha, which deals with such aspects of Islam are common among all Muslim countries. In its introduction, he observes, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you get the point. Shaulullah Muhaddis Delvi, this person, 
He is, and you know, those people who are against Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, they even blame Shaulullah because they will say that, you know, he was their grand grand teacher. And uh, Shaulullah Muhaddis Dilmi essentially believed in Islah as well as Tajdeed to reform Muslims in whatever state they are, try to make them better at whatever state they are, make them a little better. And then there are those who say, no, we need to wipe the clean slate, start something new. Right? So essentially where the Sufi Salafi divide comes from is this exact, one of the major elements of that is this exact point. Now, uh, I'm not going to go over some of the principles that he believed in right now, social principles. Now, Imam Ghazali, like Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, both of them spent, because I'm saying Imam Ghazali plus Imam Ibn Taymiyyah equals Shaulullah. Okay? So Imam Ghazali, like Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, spent a lot of his time debating and refuting the Shias. Okay? Just keep this in mind. And it says here, Imam Ghazali's efforts in defeating the Batani Shiats, one of the beneficial effects of the Nazmi school was that they paved the way for Sunni Mazhab to prevail. The Fatimid Empire, which was in Egypt, was prevailing and taking over the Muslim world. And it was the works of Imam Ghazali that not only shut off the Greek works that I was talking about, the philosophy of the Greeks went to zero after he wrote his book, um, the Hafatul Falasifa, but his works against the Shias also shut them down. So now you'll see here that it's not about uh, just so this is an example of Islam, which Imam Ibn Taymiyyah did too. But Imam Ibn Taymiyyah did things that were closer, more closer to Tajdeed, political reform, uh, trying to revive the Ummah, trying to revive the the physical aspect of the Ummah because it had all crumbled by the the Mongols. So over here, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah writes about Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani who was his, you can say, spiritual teacher from his family, okay? So, let me just read this. I wore the blessed cloak of Abdul Qadir, there be being between him and me too. Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah was quoted by Yusuf Ibn Al-Hadi confirming his Sufi affiliation in more than one Sufi order. We have the Sufi cloth, uh, of a number of sheikhs belonging to various tariqas, groups. Among them, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani, whose tariqa is the greatest of well-known ones. He further continues, the greatest tariqa is that of my master, Abdul Qadir Al Jalani. Okay. Now, what happens is, who reads Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani? The Sufis read him? Of course, we all know that. But do you know what? I'm going to tell you something about myself I've never told you. I studied in, I, stu I started my early studies of Islam in the, in the Salafi Mad Madaris. You know who they teach there? Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani's writings about Tawheed. Same teacher, but both groups have it. There's, there's no, I mean, I've been through all this. I've been through all this. And if you read the works of any of these great scholars, they had both, the great scholars had both of these attributes. Both inclined towards internal reform, looking at their heart, internal pondering, finding uh, itminan, finding tranquility through adhkar and through Qur'an, but also wanting to change the outside world. It wasn't one or the other. I don't know why people think it has to be one or the other. And we've fallen into this hoax. It, you think Imam Ghazali is going to be helped, the people that are going to help him are, are not going to be internally reformed? That they're not going to—they're not going to be people of extreme sabr, the extreme patience, and extreme gratitude to Allah, no matter what happens. Right. So, the point here is again not Salafi or Sufi. Okay, Imam Ghazali. What does he say about jihad? One must go on jihad at least once a year. One may use a catapult against them when they are in a fortress, or even. If among them are women and children. This is what Imam Ghazali says. Okay. I, I don't need to go. If there's a war. And there, you're at a fortress. Well you got to do what you got to do to break the fortress. Look at what they do at Iraq and Afghanistan. They, you know collateral damage. There is accepted. And Imam Ghazali in his wisdom is saying the same thing. 
I'm not calling towards jihad. I'm just saying that what this person had an opinion. He was a Sufi, but you would never think he would say, what? One must go on jihad at least once a year. Can you imagine him saying that? Even though his focus was more internal. But he believed in external change too. It was from the schools of Imam Ghazali. Who came from that school? Salahuddin Ayyubi. Okay? So, uh, now, Sheikh Abdul, Abdul Wahab, what does he say about the Sufis? We do not negate. We do not negate the way of the Sufis and the purification of the inner self from the vices of those sins connected to the heart and the limbs as long as the individual firmly adheres to the rules of the Sharia in the correct and observed way. His teacher was a Sufi. I mentioned this, as Sindhi. However, we will not take it on ourselves to allegorically interpret his speech and his actions. We only place our reliance on help, seek help from, beseech age, beseech aid from, and place our confidence in all our dealings in Allah Most High. He is enough for us, the best trustee, the best mawla, the best helper. Okay, let me just share with you if I have some more notes here. Uh, no, may Allah have mercy on you. Religion revolves around these four sentences in the spirit of their brevity. In this, re regardless of whether the speaker is speaking regarding the science of tafsir, science of asul of fiqh, science of the deeds of the heart, okay, which is well known as the science of saluk, the science of hadith, the science that which is permiss uh, which is permissible and impermissible, and the ihkam, which is known as the science of fiqh, or regarding the knowledge of the rewards and punishments that aspire from good and bad deeds or regarding any other religious science apart from these. Okay? So, even because, you know, this, we are the ones who have fallen into this illusion that it has to either be Salafi or Sufi. I've had, you know, I'll tell you, uh, Dr. Isra Ahmed, uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein, these are not Salafi or Sufis. These are Salafi Sufis. These are people that have taken the Salafi Sufi, the, the best of both, and tried to merge it into themselves. Okay? When it is, a, it is the case that among those who affiliate themselves to religion, they are those who focus on knowledge and fiqh and speak regarding it, such as jurists, and those who focus on worship and the quest for the hereafter, such as the Sufis, then Allah has sent His Prophet with this all-inclusive religion for two reasons. Who's saying this? Muhammad. Whatever opinion you have of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, this is what he says. You gotta have the external, but you gotta have the internal. Okay? And so you gotta have the Musa and the Khidr. Combined into one. Majma' al-Bahr, where both the oceans meet. So I want to remind you, if you still haven't uh, liked or shared or subscribed to my video, please do so. Um, and please share this, because I think more people know. This is a, now a website that is speaking against Shawlullah Muhaddis Dilbi, rahmatullahi and trying to link. This is Shawlullah here, and this is Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab here, and trying to link the link between Shaulullah to Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab to the Salafi jihadists and how this whole link uh, is, is, you know, this person wrote a paper on this. So I'm not interested in that, but that's what he did. What is the thing that's common between Imam Ghazali and Imam Netaymiyyah and Shaulullah Muhaddis Delvi? What is it that allowed them to merge both of these oceans together? It is the Qur'an. It is the focus on the Qur'an. Imam Ghazali, he says, there's one Qur'an you read every day, and there's one Qur'an you're reading for the, your whole life, and you should finish the whole Qur'an. I mean, he's, he has many interesting books on Qur'an, and many interesting commentary on Qur'an. And so, Imam Nataymiyyah, he was used to be, you know what Imam Nataymiyyah used to be called? Tarjuman al-Qur'an. He's the one who explains the Qur'an. And one of his great students created one of the best tafsir, Imam Ibn Kathir. And I think uh, Kitab al-Fawaid of uh, uh, 
Kitab al Fu'ad of Imam al Niqayim is also a great book of tafsir. It's, even though it's a small book, but I mean, and so the point is, these what was it that allowed them to merge both, to become Salafi Sufi? It was the Quran. It was the Quran. And this is where, from Shalullah to Iqbal, Muhammad Iqbal, uh, to, uh, uh, to Dr. Isra Ahmed, you know, this is what even. Uh, from the influence of who? From the influence of Sheikh Ahmed Sarhandi, you have the book uh, written by Sayyid Nursi, the great scholar of Turkey, The Supreme Sign, in which he talks about this exact issue that, you know, the Sabuf didn't do it for him, Fiqh didn't do it for him, but the Quran merged these for him. This was the great Supreme Sign. This is the book that solved his problems. You know, and, and this is a big part of what uh, Sayyid Nursi has promoted and pushed and this is exactly what you know that main part that main focus on the Quran uh, that merges both action and Iman action the outside merging these two so please don't fall for the hoax of in the illusion of the Salafi Sufi divide please don't and share this with other people and then drink from all wells you won't know where you're standing till you listen to others if you are a sufi and you never heard a salafi look spend some time with the salafi brothers if you're a salafi brother and you've never spent time with the sufis go spend time with them you might find out they're not very different from you but if you're not even going to spend time with them and just keep judging them because of what you're reading or hearing from your shayukh and you're saying only I will listen to this, 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 Sheikh. Then that's just, you know, you're 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 a locked yourself up. Anyway, I will end here. I have spoken too much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.